Hello, everyone. This is Greg Aiden. And again, I'm uh, with Aiden Leadership. And with me today, I have two of the most powerful women I have met in a long, long time. Uh, Rachel Lambert, who is CEO and founder of Brain Codes, Brain Code Center, is with us. And Angie Nowak is with us. She's the Senior Vice President of Development. So ladies, hello. Hello. Thank you so much for having us. Thank yeah. you so much, Greg. My pleasure. We're going to have a lot of fun in the next few minutes. But again, I just want to say publicly, thank you for uh, being a part of the Leadership Development Series Part 2 in Golden back in August. You were uh, not only very interesting, but I believe a lot of people left your portion of, the, of uh, your sharing with, wow, didn't understand how important neurology is. And that 1% that you kept uh, referring to, I believe, really captured a lot of people. Um, and in, in short, I, I, I think it would be great for this audience to hear, Rachel, you're a why. Why did you decide Brain Code Centers is, is where you want to be and, and what led you to that, if you don't mind? Yeah, thank you so much for, for asking that. And it's a little bit of a teaser that I give on stage and in our in our speaking events, but definitely it was through a personal experience. I truly believe that getting to the root of my own brain health and the struggles that I was experiencing led me to my calling and my passion that I do today. So after I had a pretty wild upbringing and was not going down the best path, I was actually diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I ended up finding out about the awesome ability and therapy of neurofeedback. So I did a whole entire course of neurofeedback, which is a form of therapy. Um, you can learn more about that in, in different aspects, but it totally changed my life. And like you were asking, it gave me my why. I knew at that very moment that this is what I was called to do. And this was the impact that I wanted to have on the world. So I ended up actually changing my major heading into college from interior design to psychology and neuroscience. And then I really began this journey over truly the last 10 years of founding, owning, and building one of the largest neurofeedback practices truly in the country. Um, so it was through the struggle that I found found my why. It's funny you say interior design because if I immediately thought that's what you did. You redesigned your interior with the help of a lot of different people and and not to be corny or anything, but I I I catch on to uh, how people really have have rebuilt themselves or reinvented, I guess. And uh, well, thank you for what it is you created. We're going to talk more about Brain Code Center here in a second. Angie, same question to you. Why Brain Code and what's, what's your story? Yeah. Um, so I actually had a skull fracture traumatic brain injury when I was 19. And it left me with some, some pretty major issues, some insomnia, some pretty horrible anxiety, even 10 years later. And when I was in my master's program um, at Colorado Christian University, a professor that I knew knew that I was a lot more neurologically based, and he mm -hmm. entered, ended up introducing me to Rachel and to the company. And I kind of joked that I didn't really find neurofeedback. Neurofeedback found me. And um, when I graduated with my master's, I was pursued to come work for the company, and it was game over from there. I would say that probably day one, I was like, oh, I don't know if this is for me. And then I, I fell in love and, you know, Rachel is one of my dearest friends and we work so well together. And I, I think our mission is to, you know, make sure that the world knows that neurofeedback is an option to, to work on mental health. So our missions really align and it's been such a cool journey over the last however many years. Now, I was just going to ask how long have the two of you been together officially at Brain Code, and then just for sake of sharing, how long have you known one another? I, I mean, those two, those two are the same number. Seven years, Rach? Yeah, I think we're going on almost eight here. Yeah, almost eight years of, and we met through work, but very, I mean, yeah. our, our, our souls are connected. So we became very, very close friends immediately and have, you know, been through a lot. And not everybody can work well uh, in alignment, in agreement, focused, product, you know, being productive as friends and, and, and coworkers. So God bless you. I've, I've tried it and a couple of times it's worked. But Angie, I, I want to go back to August for a second, because when I was listening to you specifically, you shared something that I haven't forgot about. And it was your, your courage and your confidence to tell the doctors that you were working with at, a, at the time, no. I will get back. I will be Angie again. And tell us a little bit about what was going on in that. I think it was 19 years old you were-ish. Yeah. 
And what was going on in your in your head and your heart at that time? Because I know there's going to be younger emerging leaders hearing to they may not have had the traumatic injury you've had, but they've had trauma in their life. And how do you help a young leader through your story get over it? Because you can and you know you will, regardless of who's in front of you saying you can't. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That thank you for asking that and thank you for, you know, remembering that I talked about it. You know, <clears throat> I think that there's probably multi, multi-faceted answers to that. One, I would say that I probably inherently naturally have a personality type that is extremely driven. If you're familiar with the Enneagram. Actually, Rachel and I are both threes, the achiever on the Enneagram. And so even at a time, you know, truly at 19, when I was in a walker and having memory issues and going through a lot, I can honestly tell you there was never a time that I thought this is just going to be it. You know, even when doctors say things like this might be as good as it gets, I, I think that having a very inherent belief in yourself that that's just not, that's not the end all be all, that's not the answer. And Rachel and I have an amazing opportunity that so many of the clients that we meet you know, really, they have found us through that inherent belief that people have told them, this is the end of the road, this, you know, just kind of this is what it's going to be. And, you know, we are able to, from a very personal standpoint, go absolutely not, right? The brain is neuroplastic, you are capable of healing yourself, um, your body is capable of healing, your brain is capable of healing. So one, I, I really do, like, I have a very inherent belief that I am capable of anything, that I can do anything that I put my mind to, that I can I can do anything. And fortunately, my body got on board with that too, right? Getting out of the walker and things like that. But even if it hadn't, right? You know, even people who might be, you know, more physically limited, your brain is always capable and your yeah. spirit, your soul is always capable of more. I'm also extremely fortunate. I have a really supportive family. My mom went above and beyond like the amount of research that she did on brain injuries and understanding what I was going through. So I also had a pretty strong at home support system and no one at home ever said, you know, just, okay, we'll roll over and just take it. You know, this, this is just going to be what it is. Let's get you some, you know, disability, not that there would be anything wrong with that, but that there was never an option for like self-pity or, or, you know, or, or accepting what it was there. It always felt like. Um, I was going to do more and and be more. I believe both of you have an opportunity to write your story if you haven't written them already, whether it's a series of articles or, but coming from a place of, especially a young person, which you both were when this happened to a certain degree, when you hear you can't, how do you react? What, what do you think and how do you feel and where do you go for help? And Rachel, just in, just in general, whether it was your your scenario or not, where do you go for help? And, and we'll move into leadership here as well. But where do you go for help when you feel stuck? You know you're not, but you feel stuck. Where do you, where do you go for? What's your resource? Who are they? It's a great question. I think my first instinct is to say I almost always have pushed away from the I can't. So if you tell me I can't or you can't, now I want it even more. So I'm not, now I'm going to go figure out exactly how to get what you just said that I couldn't do. That's just an a natural instinct that I've had since I was very young. Uh, now, as I have just gotten older and wiser and every year that goes by, I believe coaching is such an important and valuable thing to immerse yourself in on a regular basis, not just when you're feeling stuck or not just when you're at your wits end, but getting mentorship, getting coaching, um, seeking people um, that are in alignment with your values and in alignment with where you're going because truly, I mean, we're still pretty young professionals and you're kind of asking the question as you're younger. There are so many amazing people that are willing to give you their time, give you their insight uh, if you ask for it. Yeah. Or, or we also believe in investing in it too. Angie and I have invested in a lot of coaching and it has come to us tenfold. So I'm big, very big on mentorship, also traditional counseling um, and just seeking wise counsel. I think those are my main sources of kind of where I get my help from, in addition to just all of the different health regimens that I already know, right? If you're healthy yourself, then yeah. you're going to emerge as the best leader of yourself, but also your surrounding people. So everything from exercise, nutrition, neurofeedback, making sure that I'm good and balanced at my core so that I can really be the biggest helper of myself. 
Yeah. And thank you for reminding all of us. It starts with self. It starts with what we think, what we believe, what we eat, what we read, who we surround ourselves with. And and I know you didn't mention mention coaching specifically because that's what I do, but I would say from a leadership standpoint, some of the best leaders I know are also the best coaches of of their teams. And they meet them where they are and they mentor and coach and, and share experiences. So what's been to either of you, when you are on stage talking about your story, what, what are your, what are your, what are you feeling in that moment? Are you feeling excitement about sharing who you are and, and sharing your vulnerabilities? Because when I first heard both of you speak, I'm thinking, wow, I can't imagine. I mean, I had immense empathy, a, a lot of compassion. And I said, I, I, I know how it ends because I see you, but I really want to know how you got through it. And that's why I believe telling the audience how they can stay connected to really good people can really help all of us get through just about anything. And I, 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 I bring that up because integrity to me is one of my five principles, integrity, accountability, courage, passion, and humility. And integrity to me means I am, I am my word. And a lot of people, when I bring up integrity in coaching and leadership the chats, they say, well, when no one's looking is when it's really important. So who are you when you're when no one's looking? What are you really doing and and what are you really working on? And uh, Rachel, I'll throw that one to you first. Yeah, that's such a good question. You know, it makes me think, are you familiar with the the Enneagram very yeah. much, Greg? Okay, yeah. so threes, which Angie and I both, one of threes weaknesses is to put on this outer shell like you have it all together and everything's good. Your house is perfect. You got the business going on. Your relationships are good, right? And then behind the scenes, right, integrity comes into play because what's actually happening? I would definitely say there's absolutely times where I'm not living my best life and, and that boils into my integrity, right? If I'm feeling sluggish or tired, I may cut corners. One of three's biggest uh, weaknesses or blind spots would be taking the fastest route, right? So then you're missing details along the way. That is definitely a blind spot of mine. Um, I will say from an integrity standpoint, I try to be very self-aware of where I am at and how that is boiling into the details that I am or am not giving or sharing or checking off the box. I think though, that's just like a true to self type of thing, right? You know, I can't feel good about myself if I'm cutting corners. I can't feel good about myself if I am not showing up to the best of my capability for my team. So again, it goes really back to that putting your oxygen mask on first, because if there is something out of alignment with me, it's going to ripple effect into the entire company, into the entire culture and the way that I lead everybody that is on the team. Yes, yes or no, Rachel, this other powerful woman that's on the screen with you, do you at times ask her to hold you accountable and vice versa? Yes. <laughs> I, I love that. And I want you to answer the same question in a second, Angie, because if we have people that hold us accountable because we ask them to, we give them full permission to kick our ass, so to speak, uh, and say, hey, Rachel, that's not your best self, or are you going to stop here and we have four more miles to go, whatever it is. I, I strongly recommend you have someone like that and it couldn't be, or maybe shouldn't be a lover because they're always going to, well, they're not always, but sometimes they're a little easier on us than we, than we want. But Angie, what say you around integrity and then talk about whatever leadership principle you also believe in. I actually had to laugh because I feel like Rachel's husband is like the <laughs> hardest on us in our company. I'm like, Don would never go soft on us. Like if anybody's our like hardest critic, it's Don in a very loving way. But I, I had to laugh. So I'm like, not, not Rachel's. Um, you know, Greg, that I will say one thing. And I know you said earlier, sometimes it, it can be difficult and challenging to work with kind of these dual relationships, right? That Rachel and I are best friends. We're speaking partners. We you know, have a company together, like, oh my gosh, all these things are, are, are kind of balancing. One thing that I think that we hold true to is feedback and is accountability. Mm-hmm. And that actually, uh, unlike any relationships that I have, both professional and personal, that we give each other hard feedback probably daily. Okay. And, you know, it, like, does it feel good? No. Is it nice to hear, you know, like, hey, you like, I, you know, think about this, could have said this better, could have shown up differently. No. But 
we know that we're saying it out of love and out of wise counsel, right? You know, I think about those things when we ask for feedback from people. Do Does this person care about me? Do they have my best interest at heart? Do they actually want to see me succeed? Do they have any ulterior motives, you know? And I, I feel very strongly that Rachel and I show up for each other in that way, right? That we very much hold each other accountable and give that feedback. And because of that, we have built so much trust. And so we put so many marbles in the jar, if you will, that when we need to take some out, right, and give some really hard feedback, there's so much still sitting there, yeah. right? So that that is a very powerful thing that I believe that we have. When you both need something other than perhaps your husband, Rachel, who do you go to outside your sphere and say, hey, I need help? Do you actually have a coach? Do you actually have trainers? And and how do you, I mean, obviously you, you're both very fit, but sometimes being fit outside doesn't mean we are, we're all together inside. So oh I know I can speak on this one. So you got the pleasure, Greg, of meeting Joni at the gala that we all got to yes. attend the other week, which was so fun. So Joni is a equine therapist. And for anybody listening that does not know about equine therapy, we're biased, but it's probably one of the most impactful ways from a therapeutic standpoint, your body can release negative emotion. Truly, we do check-ins with Joni anytime. If we're feeling really pushed on our stress or really pushed on our limit or just questioning something, we're scheduling a, a session with Joni. For business, um, I'm actually in the process of developing a board so that when we have hard situations, we can go to the board to ask some certain questions. Yeah. Um, as well as Don, my husband, we we work together and he definitely, he's kind of like our CFO pretty much of the company because you're working with your best friend as well as you're working with your husband. How do you keep that really, really healthy on the front end? And so we have a handful of different married couples that have also worked together and successfully done that over way more years than we have. So we're immediately going to them if things are starting to get tough. It's funny you bring up equine therapy. Uh, two podcasts ago, I interviewed someone who is an equine therapist, and we talked about how she's helped lots of leaders pull their head out of their ass, frankly, around the negativity and their arrogance. And uh, and Joni happens, looks like she's she's going to be a fantastic uh, new friend for Tammy and I, her and John both. But uh, Angie, what say you around who who do you go to and when when you feel when you feel stuck? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think it probably depends on, you know, what the stuck is, is if, if it's something, you know, maybe emotionally stuck, you know, Rachel is an amazing person for me. I have a, a very good friend. His name is David, who I'll go to, to, to talk with. Again, I'm so thankful. I have an incredibly supportive, amazing family that I can go to. However, right. You know, everybody, you know, your family has a bias to you, you know, your friends have a bias to you, all those things. Um, Joni truly is an amazing person that, she has your best interest at heart, but Joni, you said, pull your head out of your ass. Joni will call you out in like, actually Rachel calls herself kind of the velvet hammer. Joni is a velvet hammer. She will just hit you so hard, but in such a loving way that you somehow want even more of it, um, which is really <laughs> impactful. And then we also, Rachel and I both have different and also, you know, we have some combined, but also different business mentors and leaders. Um, Jolita Martin, who I worked with at the university for a long time and is an amazing business mentor of mine. Derry Ebert is an amazing business mentor of mine who I've known for you know 15 years. So they've seen me back in the day to who I am now and I think are a really great compass that when you're not pointing north the way that you should, going to those people who know your foundation can really kind of help right that ship. Yeah, and what I want to bring up, and it might might be a delicate topic for for some people who who want it and they just don't know how to get it, or they're jealous of it because they want it but they don't want to do the work, you know. And but hearing your stories and knowing how hard you work, that's what I want people to leave this podcast with. I don't care if you could see them with your eyes closed, and I mean you could feel their your your essence you would automatically know that what you guys do is genuine and it comes from a place of we really, really want to help other people get to where they want to go. And they are the ones that it's been unfair to perhaps. Sometimes it's an injury. Sometimes it's genetics. And you know, my, my son was diagnosed with autism on the Asperger's spectrum. Mm -hmm. And we realized this just six months ago. 
And we adopted him from Russia when he was 21 months. So shame on us, my ex and I, and, and here we are. But now we are more aware of how we can communicate with this beautiful young young boy. And um, not everything comes easy. As I, and I am also a three. I am someone who appears to have everything buttoned up. I've had a great career in, 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 hot, in hospitality before I started Aiden Leadership. And uh, well, I've told everybody before, I'm, I'm as humble as I can get today. But I know there's more humility around the corner, and and I I eat more humble pie than anybody you'll ever meet, and it just it tastes better all the time because I know that's my way to humility and compassion. So, talk to me about what you believe is maybe your number one leadership principle. If you were if you were guiding a maybe it's not a young room, maybe it's just a, a mature room of leaders, and we've already talked about integrity and account, accountability. What other principles would you bring into the room, and and why? And Angie, I'll start with you this time. Yeah, honestly, one of really the biggest things that I've learned even over the past couple of years is transparency. And that even through speaking, right? And, you know, Rachel talked earlier about us being threes and there is a very big weakness of wanting to just, I want you to see what I want you to see. Mm -hmm. And that truly, that's not that we've just found that that doesn't serve us well, that people, we are able to help people on such a different level by being open and transparent. And it's okay to have hard days. It's okay to share your story. And, you know, Rachel, we talked about those things when we first started writing, you know, uh, neurology of the 1% that there's some, you know, a little bit of discomfort sharing the things that you've struggled through that showing pictures of Rachel as a youth and of myself in a walker, you know, that it's actually not easy. It feels really uncomfortable, but the, impact that I know that that has for people because of the feedback that we've gotten has been so powerful. It encourages you to do more. So truly when people come to us and it, when people seek leadership from us, the best advice that I can give them and the best leadership principle is to be transparent because you're not doing yourself or anyone any favors by putting on a mask or by putting on a front because people can feel that. And people can also deeply feel when you are being authentic and transparent. I believe uh, Josh Edmonds spoke right after you all, and he talked that about that very subject is you can't see anybody and no one can see the real you when you have your mask on. So amen to uh, transparency. And Brene Brown, you, you probably know who she is. She, she made vulnerability sexy, and she also married vulnerability and courage together where it belongs. And women are better at it. Why is it easier for women to ask for help because it they know it's the right thing to do men have a hard time asking for help because they look at e each other and say well we're supposed to know it all well no you're not you're just an asshole for pretending <laughs> that you know it all so i i believe in transparency and i'm i'm obviously working on it as well but there's a there's a lot of need for that especially today when everybody looks at everybody with these thick glasses of judgment and uh, yeah, it's hard to be transparent when you're being judged. Rachel, what what say you around what what would your second or third leadership principle be, principle be to this group of of uh, interested and yearning leaders? Yeah, I really go back to the first initial question that you asked us. What's your why? Not necessarily for brain code, but what is your why? What yeah. is your number one value, and what imprint do you want to have on the world? I feel like there's so many of us that go around and we don't know exactly what our skill set is. We don't know exactly what our passion is. We don't know what gets us excited. We don't know what our blind spots are. And it's really just a level of honestly ignorance of not really sitting with yourself and figuring out what that is. And I think this is what gets hard sometimes is sometimes people don't know that maybe security and safety is their number one value. And so they're okay having a job that just forms that. Well, what then could you do to enhance that and be okay that I'm going to do this part of my job because this is my number one value. So it is in alignment with the lifestyle that I want versus just showing up and being frustrated that maybe you're working this eight to five and you're not super fulfilled because then you're showing up with a chip on your shoulder and that doesn't do anything to the culture that you're around. So I really do think there's many times, Angie, and I ask this to people, what's your number one value? People don't know. They have no clue. So how can you lead yourself? How can you show up and be an asset to your team or lead your team well if you're not in alignment with what your value is and what your why is? 
So I think that is so, so, so important. Well, I'll tell you in uh, late 2013, when I I decided to leave IHG after 16 and a half years and then months later divorce, I realized I was not living my why. I wasn't living my purpose. And I frankly pretended for a while before I actually found it. But you mentioned something there that we, uh, I believe people, safety and security is the first thing they talk about because that's all they want to focus on. They don't have any higher aspirations. And again, no judgment. If you really want to be someone in this world, all you have to do is decide and then go out and find the, the, uh, uh, the, the people that can help you, the resources. And, well, I can't afford it. Well, okay. Well, who's doing something for nothing? Go, go ask them and then help them. And before you know it, you're doing both each other favor. It just takes work. And what I, that's what I was trying to get to is you all have done the work and in your world, you, 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 you ask people, you must do the work because you, you're, you're, you can't do it in, unless you get help from someone like yourself, especially when you're talking about this. I'm sure you've heard of Craig Hospital. They're kind of a world-renowned uh, uh, hospital in the area of, of brain surgery, and no one wants to go there. No one decides, I, I, I can't wait to spend six months at Craig. But damn, they they just they turn people out with with new beliefs and new ways of living. And I know you guys are connected at, in, with soul with them. And um, yeah, I, I bring them up because they're totally aligned with what you do. And every day, every day they tell people you can do this. Mm-hmm. And thank God for the donors that they have there, et cetera. So Angie, what are you, what's your 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 parting words for us? What would you like to share with with the audience relative to you? your relationship with Rachel, your success and and your future at Brain Code, anything. Yeah, I I love what you just said that, you know, Craig Hospital, you know, things like what we're doing are telling people every day that you can. And that is the first hurdle to get over. If you're telling yourself every day, I can't, or there are these, you know, walls that I've put up or there, it's just too much, you're not going to succeed. You're right, you know, because that mental block is is number one. And Rachel, and you know, you can touch on this a little bit better. Your brain does not know the difference between your feelings and your thoughts and like what you tell yourself. So even though you're sitting there feeling, I can't do this. If you tell yourself verbally, I can do this, write it down, all these different things, you actually have like a 50% more likelihood of achieving those goals just by writing them down. It's 42% more likely of achieving your goals. So even if you're feeling like, you know, I can't do this or down, or there's no way that I can accomplish this, change that mindset, change your thoughts. That is job number one. And it, that will take you pretty far just by changing that one little thing. John Eads, who wrote a beautiful book, it's about elevating leaders. It's eight principles. Uh, and he says, change your mindset, change your life. And something corny uh, that you might identify with, I believe it was 1986. Anyway, I just graduated uh, Fort Lewis and I was in Denver visiting my mom and she's always talking about, I, I can't lose weight. I can't, I can't. And, and I just, I went into a cupboard, I grabbed a can, I wrapped it with a piece of paper and I wrote on it, I can, I can, I can. And I said, mom, success comes in cans, not cans. And she still has that very can in her, in her, in her fridge or in her cupboard. And it, it I love what you said, because a victim is a victim because they choose to be a victim mm-hmm. and they allow it. And again, love you if you're, if you're stuck, but go get help. But everyone who has gotten out of a stuck place has told themselves or has been told by others, you can. And so God bless you for, for reminding us of that, Angie. Rachel, close us up. What would you, uh, what would you leave this audience with? Yeah, I think what was just on my heart is from an experience mindset, you know, we lead a team of 25 different employees and the amount of control that you really do have in your own reality is far beyond what you actually think. For, for example, there have been so many different times I get approached earlier than maybe the last review of the year and someone wants to you know, poke my brain about how they can do better, how they can come up in the company, right? Those are the people that end up getting large roles in the company. And those are the people that get raises prematurely. Those are the people that are going to get seen as leaders and move up in our company as leadership. Uh, One of the things that I always find interesting 
and Angie probably knows where I'm going with this. Over my last 17 years of doing this, I've only had one employee reach out to me proactively and say, hey, I want to know your story. How did you get into this and why? Mm. That blows my mind. Now, over time, I end up sharing a little bit, right? But if you can go to your leadership team, your manager, the owners of the company, and depends on how big of the company that you actually work with, but get to know their story, get to know their why, get to know what their expectations are and what their mission is and hear it from them, you're going to stand out tenfold in front Mm of anybody else. And that is a form of leading yourself so that you can experience leadership in its full capacity. So take risks, put yourself out there, be assertive. I know that it can feel scary. I promise you, no one's going to turn you down. If you say, Hey, I would love to get to know the mission of this company better and how I can better thrive. You'll immediately get a star in the person's mind. So that's what, that's what I would leave us off here with. Well, I tell you, I, I've fallen down when no one's looking more times than I can imagine. And I've fallen down in front of people and I get up the exact same way. And you, you brought up something beautiful. We could have a whole nother podcast on and it's called curiosity. I believe if we're curious, we really want to know where another human being is coming from, whether we're leading or following. And people that have asked me th- those questions, I mean, let's face it, most of us, even, even the ones on the Instagram that aren't threes, we we inherently love telling our story because at, at the end of the day, it's all we have. And it, if it's true, meaning it's a true story, it is what it is. But being curious is a leadership skill. It used to be a behavior. It's proven to be one of the most important things we can do. And I'm, I'm sure as little girls, you were both asking why dad, mom, friend, uncle, why, why are we doing this? Why do I have to hold a flashlight this way? And that's a beautiful question today. And as corny as it may sound, look, looks what we started with, and look what we end on, ended on the question why. So Rachel Lambert and Angie Nowak, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, and here's to Brain Code Centers. And if you haven't uh, had anything to do with neurology and you just want to know what it's all about, or you have someone that's uh, in a bad spot, look them up, braincodecenters.com. You'll find Angie, Angie and, and Rachel's pictures there. Uh, ping them and, and find out what they're all about. Uh, so again, thank you both. Thank you so much. My, my pleasure. And for those listening, don't forget Thursday, February 9th, uh, we're going to be live again at the uh, Buffalo Rose in Golden, downtown Golden for leadership, par- uh, leadership party. <laughs> it was afterwards, Leadership Development Series Part 3. So don't forget and stay tuned. And again, for those of you listening, what is your why? Where are you going for help? Who you seek leadership from? And by the way, who are you providing leadership to? Don't, don't think that the people in front of you aren't curious, but maybe they just don't have the courage to ask. So you can always ask them questions. So with that, I leave you. Go out and be kind, be compassionate, and God bless. 